Well, it's Friday, Mark. And what were we not going to do today? We can't help it. This is emergency breaking news <laughs> alert. Uh, what are we supposed to do, Hunley? We're like firemen. Uh, we have to slide down the pole. Yeah, we I were know. making an Irish stew, and then the <laughs> six alarm fire went off. Yeah, and the pole appeared, shall we say. Not necessarily well greased, but yes, Baldwin can't shut up. Nothing can ever stop. And I swear, have you noticed it seems like these break on Fridays too? Like a lot of times Friday's I'll finish a, a show day. and yeah. it's like, but you see, it's not normally a slow, slow news day. So right, it's but weird. not in legal world because they work all week to dump it on a Friday, not as a dump. It's not a media dump for lawyers. Mm. That's when they're done for the week. Okay. So that, then they start up on Monday and everything goes from there. But yeah, legal stuff like this tends to come out on a Friday. Well, yeah, and it, it keeps happening to us. So literally, you printed it out in your hand. You've got his uh, <laughs> a request for arbitration, I guess it's called. And right. um, I have it. I'll bring it up on the screen. But everybody knows that Mark's ahead of me on reading it. I haven't what? gone through it. And um, I have a little extra, too, because, you know, Baldwin, he's always got to provide some kind of video. So we can find out what he was saying at the um, film festival. Oh, right. I, we skipped so, that last week. Here he is. We did. We did. But, it, you know, it's just one minute, 41 seconds. Typical okay, Baldwin, let's roll, but baby. Let's, let's go. see what he said. I, I will honestly say the overwhelming majority of people I deal with have been very kind. They've been very supportive. They know that I have worked in this business. I don't want to get choked up here, but I've worked in this business choked for up. over 40 years. I never had any, any safety issues in my life. But what you have is a certain group of people, litigants and whatever, on whatever side, who their attitude is, well, the people who likely seem negligent have no money. And the people who have money are not negligent. But we're not going to let that stop us from doing what we need to do in terms of litigation. So we have people that are suing people that they think are deep pockets litigants, where they're going to be able to, well, why sue people if you're not going to get money? That's what you're doing it for. And someone whose job is to ensure this. Now, what's interesting in his piece, and of course he's saying, um, you know, it's not his fault, it's everybody's fault, but his, but I don't know if this is supposed to be recorded. So we have this video here and CNN released a piece saying that they recorded on different phones, oh, both weird. audio and video. So right now we're into just the audio section where I think they were sneaking the recording. Right. And that's why it was kind of, you know, sketch, but right. um, just uh, interesting. The safety of a, of a weapon have someone else whose job is to be the secondary layer of protection for safety of a weapon. And they hand you that weapon. And here we go again. Why in the hell does he keep saying Halls is a secondary person? The guy's not an armorer. And and well, I, I think that he keeps he keeps hammering on that. And I, I believe it's because it's a weak point in his case. Because I don't think that Halls should have been the guy handing him the weapon, period. And that does increase his liability because he didn't get it from the trained person. Okay. That's my theory. What are your thoughts, man? Oh, well, my theory is that they focus on Halls because Reed is asked to leave the building and he's the only responsible adult with any kind of um, authority because she's out. Sure. So uh, he is acting as her in his mind. I'm not defending him, but in their mm -hmm. legal mind, by proxy, Halls becomes her because she's not there. So when he has put down the gun, which is the training after the whatever the incident of training is or rehearsal, it's Halls who begins handling the gun simply because for whatever reason, and, and a lot mm. of it is COVID, uh, she's not in the church, which is, she's been cleared, which is insane, which is insane. But it's again, mm. that's not his problems per se. In, in theory, she should have been Halls. Correct. And Halls would have nothing to do with this. But because, and this is just my opinion, Hall, Halls is the only uh, uh, adult in the room, so to speak, in regards to Armorer, he becomes the focus. Otherwise, there is no focus. Exactly. And the focus goes where? Alec. He had Right. But I'm saying, I think if Reed was in there, it would be directed at Reed. Oh, for sure. I, I think that that one layer in between screws everything up. 
Well, I don't I, keep uh, in mind Hall is the one who says cold gun. There is some involvement with the gun there with Hall's, whether you think he's guilty or not, or you know, qualified or not, or or dysfunctional or not. Hall's is in the chain of command regarding the weapon. Whether he puts himself there right. unprofessionally or professionally, he is there, Eric. Oh, I'm not saying he wasn't there. And uh, well, right. I, I mean, uh, well, when his I say there, there, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. In well, and his lawyer is starting to back off that anyway, and she's making the claims that, oh no, 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 well, it was forget mistaken. Forget about that. None of but, this in the lawsuit is about that. This <laughs> is about the coll collapse of the attempt to negotiate oh, the craziest thing I've ever read, which is to finish the film and give Matthew Hutchins the money from the film. The gun stuff is is not really relevant in the lawsuit. It's about mm. this this secret arbitration that you and I and no one knew about, Eric. Right. This is, and it broke off is what this is about. This is why it's released. I mean, there's, yeah. there's certain things in here about the handling of the weapon, but uh, that horse has been beaten to death about the weapon handling, right? So that that's on page 13, number 41. So let's, uh, we, we can go me? to it. We can go to it. I mean, no, no. Yeah, I'm just saying the, 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 the takeaway from this lawsuit, the major news is... Uh, the fact that the the arbitration broke down, but what was the arbitration about? Shockingly, the breaking story of this day is the fact that they offered to put the entire band back together to go back to New Mexico to shoot the film. And everyone was on board with this, according to the lawsuit, and that the money would go to Matthew Hutchins, or not all the money. Again, this is all subject to really sketchy, Mm -hmm. movie math sure, and i sure. think that's why his lawyers threw it out the window uh because there's no hard numbers there's nothing you'd have to sell the film and the film festival it's the craziest thing i've ever read just in terms of where we are in the negotiation of a failed offer this yeah. is a failed offer to settle out of court that's what this lawsuit's about which is really really interesting so yeah obviously it wouldn't include the production costs and you know the product and and uh, i mean you're right about hollywood math too because i'm sure they would never make a dime it would always be in the hole if it's right. like so every right. other movie out there keep in mind he's claiming absolutely in this document no physical responsibility but no financial responsibility he's claiming as we discussed that he's protected by his llc el dorado pictures that's his mm -hmm. claim here and because that's his claim, he's saying, let's all get together, put the Beatles back together, finish the movie, and then everybody gets paid and everybody's happy. That's the takeaway from what I've read in the in the story here. Wow. That and is, it's that's crazy. Yeah, and yes, obviously rejected by uh, Hutchins attorney, who says, again, for the nine millionth time, that Baldwin's deflecting responsibility for something he did. And in that piece you showed... Hmm. He, he's giving us the interpretation of civil law saying, you know, people with no money go after people with money uh, who may or may not be negligent. You know, mm. like, OK, welcome to the history of, of civil lawsuits. That was like a re I hate to say the word retard, but that was an idiot's an idiot's version of of a civil lawsuit. No, we sue the people who have no money. Right. That's what he said. He goes, isn't it unfortunate? <laughs> The people with no money sue people with money. Of course, of course. And it's, it is completely, completely frustrating. Um, yeah. In here, he talks about the, it, which is of interest to me personally, is, which has no interest in the case really, is he shows how the film was developed and uh, who put in what and uh, how creatively it was developed. It's kind of interesting, just from my point of view, it has nothing to do with the lawsuit. In other words, they're, they're, this guy, Nigem, who I told you about originally, the sketchy cat from India, Eric. Remember mm -hmm. Nigem? He didn't have a company they could find. Well, it turns out Nigem is kind of acting like an international sales rep for the project, which doesn't exist mm -hmm. yet. And the emails involving Nigem, it's just my guess that Nigem was unofficially the international money raiser of international money around the world uh, of different markets, including India. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of good emails here, um, but mostly about the development of how this project comes together. One thing that that the humorous thing that Baldwin says is he's that this means anything because it's just rubbish. He says he's attracted to the film 
because it's a Western outdoors with uh, very little dialogue and a lot of cinematography. And I'm going like, yeah, actors like to stand in the woods and say nothing, which is what he's implying here. And they actually, he, he puts in elements of the script, like we read aloud, Eric. Hmm. He puts in uh, sections of the script that demonstrate his point of view about this issue, saying, you know, beautiful shot of the mountains and the quiet and everything else. Um, okay, and not, not to belabor the point, but um, uh, Seth Kinney just uh, reached out to me right okay. now and confirmed that nope the ad is supposed to check the dummy rounds with the armorer but not handle the guns the ad never touches the gun ever i ad's have touched guns and everything i've ever seen i don't know if they're not supposed to or or well i mean allowed. that's from that's from I mean, everyone he knows everyone right. knows that ad's ha handle guns i don't know what he's saying that for if it's technically not allowed um you know that nobody would you know you'd be sued all the time but I mean, AD's handling guns, Seth. Really? It's never happened on a movie you've been on, bro. Come on. I don't know. I, I'm Come on. Come on, Seth. Really? I mean, okay. So the armor is not around, and the AD never takes the gun out of the actor's hand. Technically, you're right. It shouldn't be done. But is it done? Is it done? The answer is yes. Okay, but regardless, I mean, <laughs> okay. If it shouldn't be done or not done, we're talking about a lawsuit here. We're talking about liability. Oh, no, no. I, again, so, I'm I mean, just saying in the real world, in, in, in what happens on an indie film. Oh, and he, he answered back. He said, props only, dinosaur. <laughs> okay, nice try. Nice try. The, uh, the history of film says otherwise, Seth. Okay, so, you know, your, your analysis of it in hiding somewhere in a bunker in New Mexico is not really uh, a courageous statement dinosaur why don't you come on the show put your face on the screen like i'm doing every week while you're hiding in your underwear in a bunker in new mexico grow some balls buddy come on out come on out seth let's go <laughs> not so He's, big now are you yeah uh, come on now come on now yeah, you uh, don't know that. it says here number 41 but reed did not instruct baldwin to check the gun himself in fact she told baldwin that it was her job to check the gun not his Similarly, Baldwin believed, based on prior gun safety training he received on movie sets, that actors should not unilaterally check guns, which is, we've had that discussion before. No, well, he said that in the interview with Stephanopoulos. Right. If, if, actors, if actors want to check a gun for their own peace of mind, they should only check the gun with the armorer closely supervising the process. In other words, actors may jointly inspect a gun with the armorer but never on their own. Baldwin has been told during prior gun safety trainings that a gun must be rechecked and cleared by the armorer if the actor unilaterally checks the gun without the armor supervision. Baldwin followed Reed's instructions during the gun safety training and throughout this time on the rust set. Well, that's his take on it, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, and again, what's his take going to be? What's that? Oh, well, what is his take going to be? Because if he acknowledges somebody should or should not, I mean, obviously... The guy is not accepting any responsibility. Hell, he's still blaming Helena. Yeah, there's nobody he doesn't blame in this thing. Um, you know what he reminds me of, of Jesse Smollett? I mean, if you look at the case we just had, remember Smollett, he blamed the judge. He blamed the cops. He blamed the lawyers. He blamed, he blamed the Osendario brothers. He blamed everybody, right? I mean, it was never Jesse. So Jesse and Alec could go start a bowling team. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Well, they are both actors. I mean, um, yes, that's kind of interesting. And Baldwin had dinner. Oh, yeah. Here's the part I was talking about. The opening of the script says silence, deafening, consuming, vast and empty eyes now unflinching, a raging sea. All this stuff that goes on about the silence of the film, which, which he said attracted him to the movie as an actor. Um yeah, I saw that, that they have a lot of the script in, in here. Um, if you want to tell me different parts, I can pull it on the screen so people can, you know, read well, along. Uh, yeah. No, I'm just going through it. I'm, I'm on page 15. There's parts where he inserts um, yeah, we're segments on... of the script on 14 and 15, which, I mean, we, we have posted that script. So that's... Um, yes, we have. On locals. On locals, by the way. On structure.locals.com, folks. It's in the description. On uh, number, uh, number 55, which is what I was looking for, Cold Gun 
is a widely accepted and significant term in the film and television. Except industry. nobody's heard of it. Seth has know. never heard the term. No, no, me too. I, uh, I got feedback. Uh, I'm a dinosaur. I never heard of it. It refers yeah. to a firearm that has no blank rounds, let alone live rounds loaded into the gun. The announcement of a cold gun is meant to assure all present that the gun has just been properly checked for the absence of any ammunition other than dummy rounds, which contain no charge by those responsible for ensuing its, its safety. 56. Um, this is on page 19. Baldwin has no knowledge of what happened to the gun from the time Reed relieved him of it before lunch to the time he was handed the gun declared cold by Halls, uh, the assistant director. In accepting the gun and relying on Hall's representation that the gun was cold, Baldwin did as he'd always done and been taught to do throughout his career all without incident. Specifically, as described above, an actor cannot rule the gun is safe. That is the responsibility of other people on the set. If actors open their gun on set to confirm the absence of live ammunition outside of the armor's close supervision, that gun should be repossessed by the armor and cleared again. To Baldwin's knowledge, several other actors on the Rust set follow the same process, relying on an appropriate crew member's representation that the gun was cold. Okay, Kennedy. I take it back. Seth just corrected me. He does use cold gun, and he uses cold gun with dummies. Okay. So I guess, I guess that is a term. I got word back, I believe, from Hannah that she hadn't heard the term, so I don't even know now, and I, I can't even confirm that. Well, what did um, – who, who was it, the actor who said that um, – Clooney? It was a Clooney, maybe, who said he hadn't heard cold gun. There was a couple of actors who mentioned that. Yeah, I think you knew a couple that didn't. You know. Right, right. So okay, I mean, by stand corrected, I mean, I literally I didn't know because uh, I know you hadn't heard, and then Clooney hadn't heard. So that's why I hate. Well, it goes into the framing of of uh, the cocking of the hammer here on sixty three. Um, he didn't care about the cross draw. It was all about framing it for Hutchins. Um, Immediately discharge. Okay, then that's on page 21. Um, yeah, that's neither here nor there. But the, the real takeaway for me is um, this attempt to finish the film. And then yep. his credits are here. Hunt for Red October, Miami Blues, The Getaway, Shadow, Heaven's Prisoners, The Jura, The Edge, Thick as Thieves, Mission Impossible, Fallout. Uh, Baldwin has also found himself on set with a gun pointed at him. He has therefore been trained for decades about gun safety on movie sets, and he received similar training from Reed on the set of Rust. He so followed... he his mind. He's like, it's not my responsibility. Da, 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 da. It's everybody else. But then he's saying how expert he is and how trained he is. So help me out. Pick, pick one. Well, he followed the training when this tragedy occurred October 21st, he's saying. Is that the he, training that he didn't attend the day before? According no, to well, Reed? he's claiming in here that he did go to a 90-minute training session with Hannah Reed um, when he arrived. And then, oh, he, Reed purchased the ammunition on the set, which was supposed to consist of only dummy rounds from Seth Kenny at PDQ Arm and Prop LLC, according to a lawsuit that Reed filed against Kenny at PDQ, quote, as suppliers of prop ammunition from the Rust set they sold, distributed, and advertised the props as dummy ammunition and not live rounds, quote unquote. And Reed, quote, relied on the trusted that they would only supply dummy prop rounds or blanks and no live rounds were ever to be on the set. All right. I'm hoping to get statements from Seth and Hannah on that. At Reed, as part. Reed further alleges, Kenny and PDQ actually, quote, distributed boxes of ammunition, unquote, that, quote, contained a mix of dummy and live ammunition, unquote. Now, he, he, he's now, I mean. It's a read suit. That's the read suit that he's going right, on. Right, right. That's what I'm saying. That has nothing to do with this. He's quoting from that, again, to deflect from whatever responsibility he's got. Right. And then it, it says, regardless of the veracity of Reed's allegations and who is actually at fault, Halls, Reed, Kenny, or some combination of the three, the fact is that on October 21st, the gun used by Baldwin discharged a live round, wounding director Sousa and killing uh, cinematographer Hutchins. Um, right. And by the way, thank, thank you. Um, South Texas gal. Oh, Thanks wow. Very much. The, the cat lady. Yeah. yeah the cute cat. Um, and then it gets into factual allegations of how they wrote the script. Well, 
he partnered with Sousa on a draft script for a Western movie. And Baldwin had previously been in talks with Sousa to act in one of Sousa's prior films, Crown Vic, which I mentioned to you earlier on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but was unable to do so because of scheduling conflicts. I think he took a producing credit, credit on Crown Vic. I'm not sure. But that's his connection to Sousa. Uh, plus some low-budget um, environmental disaster film uh, with a hurricane or something. Yeah, and um, you know, I don't know if you skipped over this, but I thought it was interesting, the communications with um, Matthew Hutchins that are in here. Oh, yeah. Um, no, no, that's 22. And yeah, uh, those text messages are fascinating. Um, but his attorney, Hutchins attorney, uh, what's his name, Panish? Yeah. Brian At the Panish. end says, you know, it's all very nice, but it has nothing to do with uh, his culpability. Um Baldwin, you know, the text is nice, but it doesn't relieve him of it, you know. Right. It's just more things thrown down the air. It's just stuff that I am um, seeing. Um, <laughs> I like that. Un unsplendid. <laughs> ah, look at that. <laughs> he brought props. Look at that. that that's preparation. See, I'm, I have a pro here. The, um, okay, here it is. Reed filed suit against the supplier of the ammunition that killed Hutchins. I don't know what that is doing anything. Uh, 118 on page 33. Reed recently filed a lawsuit against Kenny. I don't know why she's repeating this. In her complaint, Reed alleges that Rust Armorer, she was responsible for maintaining and managing operation of firearm related to movie props. I mean, my, my question is, I, first of all, they, they mentioned Gabriel Pickle here and mm -hmm. Ryan as the two main culprits, that they're running the show. It says here that that Ryan and Pickle are the people in charge of the movie, not Baldwin and not um, Halls. Or well, not I think Sousa's in charge of the damn movie. But I know. I know. <laughs> it's like we, of course, haven't heard a word from him. But now, who was Ryan again? He was one of the producers? It's his company out of Georgia. Yeah, he's the... Yeah, okay, um, okay, Ryan Smith. Oh, got it. Ryan Smith. I mean, I Pickle know, obviously is, you know, pulling the purse strings and hiring people and firing people and all that. So I know she's got to be definitely on the ground and having some. Right. But he's saying it, it's uh, respondents, Russ Movie Productions, which is the LLC for the film. And Ryan Smith, who set it up. Okay. Not El Dorado that's responsible here. Um, and, and Ryan Smith is named with Pickle. Those are the two main people that Pickle did the hiring. Pickle's in the middle of this pickle, you know, of hiring these people. Pickles in the pickle. Um, well, here it says, yeah, interesting. Uh, number two on page one, Cold Gun announced Dave Halls, the assistant director of the Western film Rust, as he handed a pistol to Alec Baldwin for rehearsal. Now, Seth is saying that's not supposed to happen, right? Is that his claim? Yes, that he okay. is not supposed to... Um handle it he's okay. not supposed to be the chain of custody right it's, okay it's so cold gun announced dave halls the assistant director of the western film rust as he handed a pistol to alec baldwin for rehearsal an industry jargon with which baldwin was well familiar after working as an actor for 42 years that meant the pistol containing either nothing or only dummy rounds dummy rounds have a projectile but no charge blank rounds have a charge no projectile. Uh, which is a repeat of what you said earlier right what's that are they repeating it in the suit? The same thing? No, no, this is there? page one. They, later oh, on, yeah, I'm, oh, I'm oh, just oh. reading page one. Okay. But just to catch up here, it says, because of Halls, immediately before the handoff to Baldwin, upon information and belief, Halls had taken the gun off a prop cart after it had been loaded by the set's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez Reed, the person responsible for gun safety and managing the operation of a firearm of firearm related props on the set. Reed claims to have personally checked all of the rounds to ensure that they weren't hot, quote unquote, and then loaded them into the pistol. Halls, quote, later told an investigator that after Reed opened the gun for him to inspect, he did not check all the rounds as he should have before he handed it to Baldwin. OK, and then it gets into the her purchasing the stuff. Also, from. the cart. The cart's a con an, another um, point of contention because uh, Reed's suit that said there was no cart. 
Oh, and right. Then, and so I, I, I don't, this is the part that's making me crazy is I hear about the cart here that you're just reading. And um, I heard about it early in the case that Hall said, but then it's like a denial. It's like, no, no, there's no cart. Reed's suit said there was no cart. And then um, there's even the question whether it was handed to Hall's or wasn't handed to Hall's. So I, I feel like um, Hall's, his lawyer may be working in the middle too. There, I, really, I still don't know exactly what happened. <laughs> uh, it says here Baldwin is an actor. He didn't announce that the gun was cold when it really contained a live round. He didn't load the gun. He didn't check the bullets in the gun. He didn't purchase the bullets. He didn't make the bullets and represent that they were dummies. He wasn't in charge of firearm safety on the set. He didn't hire the people who supplied the bullets or check the gun. And he played no role in managing the movie's props. Each of those jobs were performed by someone else. It's kind of an interesting angle to it. Yes, it's the everybody but me. Oh, then it goes into his history in film, how this has never happened before. Um, and they list his films, blah, blah, blah. Um, however, this uh, arbitration thing I find to be the most fascinating part. The fact that they were trying to, I don't know if Seth knows anything about this, about regrouping and shoot, re, you know, I guess not reshooting, I guess shooting. The rest of the film i don't know how much is in the can and what happens to that um i don't know how many pages they were into this thing at, at that time sure. but i, I understand it's probably a few weeks right eric yeah i um uh, i'm not sure seth uh what day was that i know it was october 21st so the 20th day of filming or wasn't it a 21 day shoot or a 30 day shoot i think it was like 30 um i'd have to look i have the Oh, it was 11 of 21, so oh, 11 just, of 21. just over halfway. But then right. again, it depends on what was shot. I mean, if a lot of action already was shot and it was like more interior slow scenes, right. then right. that would well, be Well, one of the emails, if you read the emails, they're concerned about the wrap party uh, and the last day of the shoot, which is October 31st. They're concerned about that being a half day and the wrap party having to be at night and Baldwin having to leave to go away because the movie's over. Mm. And... Uh, the rap party they're suggesting should be the week before. This is what they're concerned about. Oh, good Lord. Anyway, okay, he's saying they were on day 12 when this happened. Oh, day 12 of 21. Right, so 11 of 21 in the can. All right. Day 12, they were shooting. Right on. But anyway, to, to get everybody back together, to go back to that ranch, to, re, to, to pick up where they left off, ostensibly, is the offer to the Hutchins family. And when did that come about? Was that immediately this after? This is what's been happening in the past few weeks. Remember we were saying nothing was happening? Sure, this, yeah. what I'm gathering here, is this arbitration has been happening mm. under the radar. And we've had these minor media explosions with him going on TV and then Baldwin going on TV. But this has been going on for weeks, according to this. That's so crazy. Uh, I don't know. Seth has heard about this arbitration. Oh, he did. Okay. No, right. I'm. I don't know. Yeah. I'm. Oh, I'm, oh right. I'm right. standing. I, I didn't hear anything about this. Um. Well, it says I mean, had he, six. he would have to know pretty. I mean, they, where would they get the equipment? Unless well, okay. I just want to get something else out. What Baldwin says in the lawsuit is, we needed a quick answer to this movie pickup thing because the kid would age out. Hmm. The kid himself, who's in, and which is interesting and true, because you know a lot of these kids age pretty quickly when they're that young. Oh, you yeah. know, a year or two can Especially, age. Especially yeah, ten, eleven can. Yeah, they yeah, can. Yeah, yeah. That's what the kid is. Go, jump six inches in the uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Smith is an associate, and his associate Gabriel Pickle hired the crew of Rust. Uh, but he's claiming his only involvement was creative, but he's not involved in the day-to-day -day production. Uh, Smith and the other producers secured the financing, as we um, pointed out in episode 65. Rust had six credited producers: Ryan Smith, uh, Nathan Klinger, Ryan Winterstern, Matt Del Piano, who, as you recall, in episode 35, uh, was <laughs> Baldwin's manager, who used to be the agent at CAA, who produced the roast. He's also D'Souza or Souza's uh, manager. manager or uh, manager now, or, right? Or agent. Manager or agent. I can't remember. You know that. Well, I think he's a manager. Well, what do I know? I, maybe he was a C. I think he left CAA, though. I think he did. Uh, but it says one of the other guys is Angel Nijem. That's the mystery guy. 
That's the one who they didn't find a company on who I think is the foreign sales guy. Oh, oh yeah. From yeah, India, yeah. who India, seems India. to float in and out of these movies. If you look at his credits. And family uh, money, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They said he was a millionaire, that he had family money. Oh, he wanted to be an actor himself. And oh, he is, is an actor. Bad news. Uh, super chats aren't working for you? I, I don't know. Is anybody else having problems with super chats? Please, please let us know. because uh, Obviously, we care. That's what happened to Viva the other night. I, I know, so I've got to look at the uh, file while we're doing this and see. If okay. Well, Baldwin on collaborated it. with Sousa on the writing of the Rust script and was given a story by credit for his work. Now, traditionally, a story by credit means that the, the story by guy came up with it. That's the strange thing about the story by credit. That <laughs> Baldwin came up with this story and then brought Sousa in to write it. And then and normally, Sousa and... Baldwin would submit the different drafts to the W. Georgina can't super chat. Excuse me? Georgina can't super chat. And we are yellow, definitely. So I don't know what's going on, folks, but okay. You, YouTube hates us, and I, you know, hate to have up for business, but um uh you can there's PayPal in the description, things like that. I mean, we deeply, deeply appreciate it. And I'll stop interrupting. I don't know what else I can do. Okay. Um anyway, getting back to the story. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with Super Chats, but I don't know either. Um, it says Baldwin's only involvement in Russ's finance uh, and Russ finances was his forfeiture of his own fee, which is what I want to get to. Mm -hmm. uh, starring and producing was set at, at and this is uh, interesting, at only two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and Baldwin gave back a hundred thousand dollars as an investment, and he had offered an additional thirty seven five from his fees, I believe, in the Looper debacle. Uh, that was when Looper mm. came to him about the hotel room. But that being said, two fifty. Um, but it doesn't explain. Thank um, you. Yeah, super sticker. What about that? Isn't that something? It's all I, I put it up. Yes, it's something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, isn't that a thing like super chat? Well, unfortunately, um, oh, thank you, Tyler Durden. Is a stupid this name. Guy's, I love this guy, Tyler Durden. He's been with us since day one. This guy. Oh hell yeah, hell I like yeah. this guy. Uh, anyway. Uh, the financing of the film, it's interesting because do, it doesn't state what his back end is for El Dorado, is what I'm saying. There's no, no. from what I've seen, unless I missed it. Um, oh, he, he says that in low-budget films, he's not allowed to bring in his own people, Baldwin. And that is used as another buffer by his law firm to suggest that because it's low-budget, Pickle and Ryan do the hiring and he's got emails in here from the makeup girl and the different people who normally in a big budget film he would bring in his own people hmm. so in other words he's trying to distance himself from the hiring of everyone wow oh thank you um nebula games i never knew that Always exudes extreme disdain. What does that, what does that hey. even mean? You're the sweetest yeah. guy in the world. Yeah, I guess so. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm a lot harsher than you, obviously. <laughs> but <laughs> not here. I'm from Brooklyn. You're from Arizona. That's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> Dear Lord. Um, oh, God. That's so crazy. But it's interesting how they put the film together. Well, I, I, the 37000 too, though, I mean, maybe as a looper. I wonder if that's documented somewhere or if he was just... Uh, well, I, I think that's the minute. offer he made to... the Not to looper personally, but I think to... Maybe the production to, saying, to the hey, production, you get a hotel? But so then they, it goes into the fact that they then quit. So it never became a reality because they quit the next day. Right, and I guess I, what I'm saying is, I guess I'm cynical, and I'm going. Hmm, I wonder if there's an email or <laughs> something that you well, actually I mean, did it, offer it, that. Either Looper knows if he doesn't. If we ever get to talk to Looper, we could get to the bottom of this. I tried. We tried, tried, right? Yeah, I've I've got a connection to him, right? But it's one you know removed. That that's the problem I have with this is I do kind of talk to people, but it's through intermer intermediaries. Um, Seth, I'm talking directly to. Okay. So when I said Seth said this, he literally texted me that and that's an answer, but other ones, I am speaking to them through somebody else mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, verifying it and getting it um, confirmed the information coming back, but I don't have a direct connection to them. So, okay. What I'm saying anyway, yeah. whether we have it or not, the guy who would verify this is Looper. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, not the uh, number or, or itself. Pickle, pickle or oh, something. Pickle. Yeah, pickle. Would because... help that. Yeah. I, I, if, believe me, if there was an email from Baldwin saying, take 37.5 out of my uh, paycheck, we would have seen it already. That's that's why I said it. I, I wonder if right. it was he, he went up to her. He said, hey, you know what? Uh, maybe I can do something. It's like, it, it, was this a verbal thing that we'll never be able to confirm or prove? And he's Unless just, Looper you know, says, you know, that he said, I'll give 1% of my pay or 5% or whatever, you know. I'll no, throw it down. He, yeah, it, I, I don't know. I mean, that's didn't what did Looper say? Do you remember about he did? Did he say that Baldwin offered money? I don't think he. I don't did. remember. I think Baldwin. Maybe the said people that out there did. can help me remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could be wrong. I think Looper um, never claimed that that happened, but Baldwin claimed that that happened. You know, when, when, you know, Looper went on the, the morning television network, you know, whatever, and talked about it, then Baldwin was like, um, I offered him blah, 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 money. And thank you, Julia Blair. Julia Blair. And thank you, Reese. Happy I'm happy you're catching you us live, too. You know what? If we stay on for hours, more people will catch us live, Eric. If we just and stay on. Check. Yes, we'll people come on home from work and they go, look, they're still on. It's like a marathon. <laughs> yeah, can we we pay seven hours. <laughs> They're not going to rest until the case is resolved, they said. Oh, God. Um, he was not involved in retiring. Yeah. Okay. Upon information, believe it. Um, yeah, there's some mention about the two interviews um, that each one of them did as, as to trigger something. In other words, he, he Hutchins mentions the Stephanopoulos one, and then uh, here they mention the fact that he did, what did he do, Good Morning America, Eric? One of those. I, 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 Good Morning America did a lot of these. I know. Um, Seth Kinney oh, did the Today Good Show. Morning America. No, no, he did the Today Show. Reed. Seth. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, you're, you're right. Matthew Hutchins, right. rather. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good Morning America had uh, Seth, had Hannah, had Thel. Um, ABC also had obviously Alec himself. Um, a lot, a lot of different people. So it, that was weird. And then, uh, and then Hutchins went on today. So kind of feel like the networks themselves are kind of like... Well, then the LA Times course. cited us as a source of, uh, of hey, information. Had, they, yeah. And the oh, LA Times is different. watching this now going, we got a deadline. Hurry up, Grow Baron Hunley. Let's go. Get to the front <laughs> of this thing. We got to put out a newspaper. Well, it was yeah, nice that they credited us, though. I got Normally, I, I was kind of surprised that they did that. <laughs> I mean, when we were at the LA Weekly, they despised us. You know, um, they just didn't think we were even a newspaper at that point. And then mm. when the recession hit in 2009, they all got fired and went to the weekly begging for jobs at a newspaper they despised. Hmm. Is my mic crackling to you? I'm getting no, people you sound in the chat. great. You sound great. Hmm. Sorry, Talix. Hopefully it'll. Sorry. Off. It might be, you know, something about it. But... I don't know. A couple of people. I, I just want to make sure that <laughs> Eric, your mic. Could... I hear it perfectly. Okay. Uh, it sounds good to me. Uh, yeah. But they, you know, they talk about the dinner they had, and um, uh, it says at the dinner they did not discuss safety at the dinner, and at no point did Baldwin discuss gun safety with anyone beyond Reed, Sarah Zachary, Nicole Montoya, and her twin sister, Nicole Montoya. <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah, that, that and was on me. The, the poor son of a big Dave Halls. I mean, what happened to Dave Halls' uh, attorney? She kind of disappeared. That woman we saw. No, her. Uh, no, she's still out there because remember, okay. she's the one who said that. Um, no, 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 no. A Dave didn't hand it to Alec. Mm. Alec, while he was changing, handed it to Dave, and right. then Dave courteously held it and they gave it back. Which is was the first time we heard that, and yeah, that the just first time came we heard up. that. Yeah, it was yeah. very recent. That was very recent. The sheriff said that witnesses contradicted Halls, saying mm. that he did hand the gun to Baldwin directly. But yeah, what Baldwin happened? says he did, and I guess weird. It's a weird I guess Serge. Uh, you know, I've never heard from Serge other than you know just making a statement on everything, but I'm sure he was a witness, right? And. Um, and the big guy, the special effects guy with the cowboy outfit on. Yeah, that stood by the door and watched everything Gandhi, all the time. Gandhi, remember him? Gandhi, yeah. Or Gandhi, he Gandhi? A, Gandhi. Yeah. Gandhi was his name? I think it's Gandhi. I don't know. Yeah, Gandhi, yeah. Um, And then you had the sound person. You had the um, camera guy, the mm -hmm. gimbal, 
and the gimbal and uh, the script, the script supervisor. supervisor was, was there sitting too. there. Yeah. I wonder how she's going to get paid. I don't like, know. All Red has piped piped up about it, like yeah. saying, "No way, you're not out." But I I don't have that um, right right now. I mean, what is All Red going to do on this one? She's the most high profile, biggest mouth in this entire festivity. Sure. Yeah. I mean, she, she likes to get paid. Yeah. I'm, Who is going to pay her for that woman's ear ringing? I know she's got to find. She must see a payment in there somewhere because I don't see her taking the case otherwise. Right. Right. Maybe I mean, she's taking it. She's taking it uh, for a third. I mean, they're all taking it for a third. Um, <laughs> what's that? Suicide? No, I mean, that maybe Baldwin could be charged of being a participant in a suicide. Just saying, no, it sounds nuts. But so I just want to say something. If I disappear after this show with Hunley, I am not <laughs> suicidal. <laughs> no matter what you it. think, if I don't turn up. I would first of all, I'd ask this guy Seth Kenny. He'd be a main suspect. But <laughs> I just want to say I am not suicidal. To quote Jesse Smollett yesterday, one of the craziest oh god uh, court TV episodes I've ever seen. That that oh. poor judge. I mean, he was reading him the riot act for two hours before. I'm going like, please God, such so sentence this guy already. I'm going to commit suicide. I can't take it. <laughs> the funny part was though how Smollett's lawyers were scrambling. They're like, uh. A uh, motion to flip this. Right. Yeah, it's right. under consideration. For the record, I heard it denied. For right. the record, I heard it denied. For the record, I heard it denied. Yeah, I don't understand. I think they were caught off guard. I think they thought. Oh, they, they, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, All right, right. I know they were because I was on that panel. Oh, and yeah. I was the guy on that panel with all the lawyers saying, I hope for 30 days. I mean, that was my hope is that he'd get at least 30 days. They're all like, getting, no I way, he's get getting no nothing. I thought he'd just get probation, Eric. I that's really what did. they all thought. That's what they all oh, thought. Okay, all right. And I was, so that's what I'm saying. I was the outlier thinking, I hope he gets 30 days. That would be great. And it may still be 30 days because, you know, one, one credit, the judge did actually make sure he was led out of the courtroom to the jail. So he has served, at least as far as I know, one day. So he has at least served time. Two. Today he's yeah. eating a bologna sandwich and saying, why can't I get that stuff from... Uh, subway like i when i went out in the freezing cold to get that sandwich that night exactly you know? exactly i mean the judge just went on and on and on saying well, dude, he perjured himself on the witness stand for three days i mean wow he did but he, part of the reason the judge i think went on and on and on is did you see what happened before that what i i, I joined the live stream just after two by I the time the judge got a hold of it it was like um three and a half to four hours later so the, the, the oh, okay. defense lawyer you know this woman that he had was going on oh i heard that i saw hours. that on twitter yeah Good i wasn't Lord. watching it yet until until i saw that the judge was lambasting him finally so the judge didn't start till like three o'clock <laughs> no no <laughs> no no, my, no that's my counseling later. i gotta go see ken right after the show no he didn't start till like over after six o'clock i mean it was like oh oh she went on forever she relitigated the entire case i i'm sitting there you know with the lawyers i'm like Man, I was thinking this would be a nice live stream. Jump in for an hour. I'm like, right. Two hours in, she's still talking. And well, I, I, I had no idea that the guy was Jewish. His grandmother shows up after the press gaggle uh, disperses, and she comes up to the microphone. Everybody left, and she says, "I am his grandmother. I'm 92 years old. I'm Je Jelly Rosenberg." I'm going, what? <laughs> what is this angle now? Did you know this that he was half that he was oh. half Jewish? Uh, no, I didn't. And okay, somebody said it was 35 minutes for the judge. So wow. in fairness, wow, wow. Okay. Um, it, it just felt for like forever. Felt longer. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that um God, his lawyers, they went on and on. And it was a, by the time they got through that part, it's like, okay, now we start to call the witnesses. I was like, right. But this may be a foreshadowing of what we're gonna cover with Baldwin, Eric. Oh God. No, what if I mean that even if that's televised, God, I hope it is televised because right. You know, obviously, I, I might know some lawyers who can help us uh, parse right. it. Right. But, I mean, I assume a lot of it's in L.A. Spirit Court here at Stanley Mosque Building, which is pretty hey, close Hey, you could by. be on the scene. Yeah, no, <laughs> I could walk down there. That I could definitely to. cover that one in my underwear. And I don't know what's in Santa Fe, but... Um, yeah, definitely but, in your underwear. In my underwear, I should do this? Okay. Yeah, well, wear a tie to be respectable. I wear a tie in my underwear, <laughs> yeah, like I normally do. El Dorado pictures. That's, oh, Santa Fe. Oh, it doesn't say where it is, but I think it's here. I think it's here in LA. But um, but if it's a criminal, if it winds up being criminal, then it'd be in Santa Fe. 
So that right. Depends. Okay. So the woman who was featured in the Vanity Fair piece, the uh, Soros district attorney mm -hmm. who claimed uh, one of the claims that she made in the article was uh, demonstrative that by the end of February, she would have the FBI forensics report. Now, what is today's date? After that. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to remind everybody <laughs> that in the article, she was definitively stating that the FBI, the reason, the reason I mention this is because the reason she said she hasn't done anything is the FBI assured her that they would give her the forensics by the end of February. Right, and then she said, though, it's going to be months before anything happened in that same article. <laughs> right, so she's trying to put some distance between the case and the human race, put it that way. She's trying to put some, maybe she'll become a governor by the time, you know, maybe she'll be termed out by the time this case. I mean, this is a woman who doesn't want any part of this case, clearly. Clearly. Yeah, and, and, and he's moving so fast on the um, on the civil side. It's, it's almost like he read the tea leaves or has been told, yeah, the fix is in, you're in the clear. So he's going all till you know all out on trying to bat you know beat the civil case because one would think that I would be delaying that civil case forever. Okay. Uh, because because Again. if he's subpoenaed and has to testify in the civil case, it could be used in the criminal case potentially. So you want to try to push that back. Just so people know, and I, it's, I can only say this because these lawyers and I was involved in some stuff here recently. There is a five year waiting list for civil cases in Los Angeles. The idea that they think they're going to go into court like this is a real system is absurd. Mm. It takes five years on average before you even th these dates are going to be this hearing after hearing after hearing after hearing. They're not jumping the line of the 10 million cases in front of them. You know what I'm saying, Eric? Mm -hmm. Because there's a shutdown of COVID and the normal wait time, I think the legal, the legal waiting time in L.A. is five years by law. Could this affect his insurability? I mean, I know, it, I, I guess it didn't in England for that production, but I'm just curious if if, if his status is un, uncertain. If could well, I think it may problem? affect the 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 status of El Dorado Pictures because mm -hmm. if El Dorado is subject to a lien or a lawsuit, um, which it is here, mm -hmm. Alexander Baldwin the Third and El Dorado Pictures are suing against Rust Productions and Ryan Smith. So, but the others are suing El Dorado. So, in theory, unless he starts, which he may do, a new LLC free and clear of Rust uh, of uh, El Dorado, um, I don't know if he's bondable. Yeah, well, that was my question, and yeah. and, and he's transferring all this stuff to Hillary, uh, Hillary. It appears. Is that true? I, well, that's what I've been hearing, and um, and he's. Buying a lot of real estate. I mean, he bought a couple houses. There, there's. Are you saying that he's hiding his wealth? Is that what you're implying, Hunley? I'm saying I'm saying that he's making investments for his future. Right. Well, he loves crypto. All of a sudden, <laughs> I don't know what that's about. But he's, <laughs> he's doing commercials. I saw on late night TV. Hi, I'm Alec Baldwin. Have you thought of cryptocurrency? It's not bad. Why not take a chance? I took a chance, and look at me. You ever see they always got those older actors that you remember doing those late night? I mean, really guys that are just burnouts at the end of their careers. Like Wilford career. Brimley forever. Yeah, Brimley and, and, and there's like five or six of them. Robert Joey, Conrad. Joseph, what's his name? Robert, Robert Conrad, Conrad. Right? Yeah, he, he did the legal commercials. It was like every city you ever could go to, you see the same actor and they would just fill in whatever the law firm was. They're here for you. Right, right. And then there's oh. the private eye guy. There's a couple of old TV actors. I think Alec Baldwin's going to be doing crypto uh, on late night TV. Well, you know, there's a, there's a slot for him. John McAfee's dead. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so there, there's always, always a, an opening for Alec. But I could just see this, the hidden message of, yes, I invested in crypto because my money's in danger. Right. <laughs> Are people closing in on your bank accounts? Hi, I'm Alec Baldwin. I've got 72 kids and a wife who's nuts. <laughs> I have an anonymous wallet. You're right. Where I put my currencies. Did you see? Did you? This is off the topic, but there's a a, a me or a commercial, uh, not a commercial, a, a 
video floating around of this black rapper who gets out of his truck and I don't know, he's got a truck, but he pulls in the gas station and he looks up at the gas prices and it's like seven dollars for each of them. And he reaches into his pants pocket and he pulls out some singles and he just hangs his head almost in tears and he opens up his wallet. And there's a photo of Trump and he rubs it with his finger and he starts crying. <laughs> you got to see this. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's, like, it's very oh, funny. Oh, my God. All right. So where are we with this? Yeah, where, where are we with this thing now? Uh, I mean, it's, it, it is an update. It's news. It's the latest Baldwin. Um, is this what they come, wanted? I don't know. I don't. I think that there are many people who want this. And then there's the rest of us. But <laughs> oh, hold on. I just want to add one little thing here. Yes. Because we mentioned her, Mamie Mitchell, um, number 68, page 21. At this time, Russ script supervisor, Mamie Mitchell, approached Baldwin and said, quote, you realize you're not responsible for any of what happened in there, don't you? Mitchell is now suing Baldwin. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's a great quote. Now it says Mitchell is now suing Baldwin. Yeah, well, because you could see that conversation. Like that may have actually happened. That and may then, have actually and, happened. And then she uh, consulted um, this this lady, Gloria Allred, who said, uh, "No, you didn't say that. We are right. suing Alec Baldwin." Wow, I wonder if she did say that, Eric. You Why not? I mean, not I mean, uh, I could see that happening. I mean, well, you're, yeah. where's your bread buttered? Yeah, and then you want to make somebody feel better. I mean, you know, it could be just that. It could be, you know, uh, it's a mess. It's a mess. So mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll keep an eye on. I do. I'm I'm hoping to get a statement from, um, I don't know, maybe Seth Kenny. Come on, Seth. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Give us something, brother. I, I, I've reached out and I'm trying to get something back from uh, Hannah, even a statement or anything else. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I've put the word out to anybody who wants to talk to me anyway us anyway statement phone call message um, in a bottle message comes, in a bottle it comes be, floating in from the mediterranean it's, if it's anonymous then i'll make you know we'll, we'll make do with whatever comes in we are very interested to know and we definitely definitely want to follow it so what do we have next it's not baldwin what but it is definitely a shooter what, what do we have Jack Ruby. Oh, Jack Ruby on Tuesday. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> Jeez. Jesus Christ. How could you Jack, Jack Rubenstein. How could I forget the Tuesday? Well, today's Friday. Um, yeah, on Tuesday, we're going to do an episode called Who Was Jack Ruby, I think is the title. And um, we're going to go into some of the uh, real story of Jack Ruby, who he was. I'm not even going to give you any hints because I'm just going to give you the party line at the beginning and then tell you the real dope on Jack Ruby. Um I think we're going to have a St. Patrick's Day special, Eric. On we're going to be recording. Yeah, we're going to be recording something. Um, well, you don't have to tell them it's recorded. It could look like we're doing it on St. Patrick's Day. What do they care? What how we make it? Whatever. <laughs> it, 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 it will magically appear. It'll it, it look like a, a live show. Well, some of them will come uh, on. Know, say, speaking of locals, no, yeah. I, I want to thank everybody who has joined, and I really do appreciate it. Unstructured.locals.com. As of today, we have 600 people supporting us on Locals, which wow. is just amazing. And wow. I mean, seriously, thank you so much. And the more Did anybody buy are, the swag that I tried to sell last week, did we sell anything? Do you know? I think a couple cups went. And okay. I, I, not a lot. I mean, but more people will find it. We'll, we'll discover fewer Chinese sources. Right. And here's the official purple cup. There's only two of these in existence. Although I did, I, I did, and I bought this a long time ago at purplecups.com. It's now defunct, but uh, obviously they only sold purple cups, so they quickly went out of business. It'll um, come. Abby Hoffman's to the show coming. About Abby Hoffman, we have Viva now acting as if he's the Abby Hoffman of Montreal. So. Right. I, eventually, he's going to be the complete spitting image. So we'll right. just bring him on and have him. Uh, we'll have Viva on, and he could dress like Abby, wear the American flag shirt. And read and, lines like Abby. So anytime right. well, we Abby, Abby wore the folk, flag shirt on the Merv Griffin show, and they had to black out Abby from the neck down <laughs> like they did with Elvis from the waist down when he was on um, Ed Sullivan. So mm. Abby got the blackout, and uh, so did Elvis. 
Okay, and Tom, what nobody is completely safe from anything, but I will say that locals, especially since they bundled with Rumble, all their assets have been moved to different servers. So they control their own servers, they control their own back end. Um, and I don't think you mean Apple, I think you mean Amazon, because Amazon is who took out Parler, Parler because right. it was running on Amazon Web Services. So again, nothing is guaranteed. And it is very possible the locals app could get kicked out of Apple because of a dispute. You know, anything happened. But I do think that it's about as safe as we can get. I at least get um, an email list out of it. We both do. So let's say something does happen. We can send out email to everybody and say, hey, this happened. This is where we went. This is what's going on. Or if something happens to the channel, it's it's very true well who, uh, who are all these people who are following me on locals where are they from from the general locals community um we have locals from from all, all the locals. other locals the other locals well it's from all over the world i mean locals is kind of weird because you can follow multiple communities and that's, so, what, I'm, that's what i'm asking yeah. that's because that's, it seems like there's more people following me than we have members uh no no we oh, have no. um uh, I don't know, 5,000 members or something. I, wow. I, I don't we, we have more members than subscribers. So I can share the entire playlist to the JFK assassination groups. Um, I, I'll look at it. I haven't made all the JFK stuff yet, but I might, I'm, I might be doing that uh, on YouTube. Sure. Sure. As we, especially we get more in definitely because we've got Jack Ruby, we got tippets. We've got, um, uh, we'll have the Lee Harvey Oswald coming up. You, uh, Ruth Payne, I think. It's George DeMore and Schild we're going to have, Clay Shaw we're going to have. Yeah, um, we're definitely. There's some overlap characters, but we're going to do a separate Marine Oswald uh, when, you know, that's a separate ep episode. Everyone's getting their own episode. And then we're going to make a trading card so you can trade the cards among your, <laughs> your friends. You <laughs> get the go. Marine Oswald in doubles, you flip them, trade them. You know, you'll get a Clay Ooh. Shaw, you could trade them for a, a George DeMore and Schild. Actually, that would be amazing. I, I should look that up and see if we can a have like AUS cards of like everything. Oh, when I did like, mass murderer trading cards for Lampoon, um, people thought they were real cards that we were selling at Lampoon. So many people called up said, I want to buy the set of cards, but we didn't have a set of cards. We just had the, you know, the magazine print. And um, huh. well, well, now we'll I think now there are serial killer cards i mean that was the whole uh, no, no, no yeah there's a few a few different yeah. kinds but but that might be an interesting idea i don't know if we have enough audience yet but i do know somebody who made a game and has connections to car companies so if we could uh -huh. figure that out you Let's know like david steves could be a card with a basic description on it and you know right. all the different all the different characters and tales it'd be interesting interesting i don't know interesting. it's something to mull over I'm already but, mulling. Oh, I see you got the book back there, the JFK book. That's yeah. If, if you want to get one book, um, if you only bought one book, I would buy that book because that book is has the actual Oliver Stone script in there, footnoted of every, every other book in the script. And not only does it vindicate Stone, but it's an incredible erudite educational PhD thesis, if you want to look at it that way on the assassination because he has the source of every single little thing in the movie footnoted uh it's an astounding piece of work it came out a few years after the movie um with sklar who is a professor um of history i think who co-wrote the script with him yeah, yeah. Makes, makes total sense and also the destiny betrayed has come out on amazon we were talking about yesterday yes. which is a four-hour version of the two-hour it's very confusing. It's the worst marketing I've ever seen in my life. JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass was the name of the two-hour cut for Showtime. This is the four-hour director's cut, which instead of being called the four-hour director's cut, is called Destiny Betrayed. You know what, though? Maybe, maybe that was um, a courtesy to Showtime, now that I think about it, because they wanted to have an exclusive. And so by having the two different names... Right. They have their exclusive and and remember Oliver when he was on Rogan did say Showtime has been really good oh, to him years. and oh, he had years, problems. Years and years. Well, he had problems with HBO because HBO yanked the Castro documentary he did the first night it was on because of the yelling by the anti-Castro Miami community. They buckled literally in 24 hours after it aired. Never aired again and they own it. They won't give it back to him. So mm. when he ended up at Showtime, they rolled out the red carpet for him. Don't forget, he did the Putin interviews, and he's done a lot more. The you know untold history of the United States 
which was nine parts, Eric. I mean, I, if you want to give your kids a gift, you know, uh, for their birthday, give them the, the nine CD collection, uh, DVD collection of the Untold History of the United States, plus the book, which is an unbelievably great book like that JFK book, the Untold History of the United States book by Stone. Um, also, it's the footnoted version of the series for Showtime. But yeah, I mean, the two hour thing, like I said, is called Through the Looking Glass. This is called Destiny Betrayed, which is the reason it's confusing is that Jim DiEugenio, who I know, has two books that he wrote called Destiny Betrayed. And now the DVD four part thing is called Destiny Betrayed. It's very confusing. And I know that it's based on his work, Oliver Stone. So right. It's, it's well, it's, that, so. he's the credited writer for the docu series. Um, Jim DiEugenio and um, rightfully so, which is fine. But I mean, it's just, it's weird because he's got two different books named Destiny Betrayed and now this. He really Destiny. likes that name. I, it, I don't get it. I, it's just, it, it should have, unless there's some legal reason, it, maybe it's two separate corporations. You know what? They probably sold it to another company because it says Shout and it, it looks like two separate sales. The Could four be. hour and the two hour. So they may have legally had to come up with another name is probably the answer shout has some range though because i think shout is the one who released wkrp in cincinnati with the original music what yeah i i swear i just i happened to look that up recently and i think i think it was shout who did that you mean a re-release of a dvd series of yeah, but the wkrp because wkrp they released it on dvd but it had like bs music because they couldn't get the rights figured out oh oh i think and, shout uh, is shout. like rhino remember rhino eric right right right, right. right. I, I got that know. impression but uh, apparently right. they got the rights to like 95 percent of the music so even still there's a couple songs that aren't on there i think like pink Floyd. well that's what happened while we couldn't make the heavy metal music uh, movie which is so, going to be an episode coming up right it is or well, at least a short on locals <laughs> okay yeah, well, well, actually, I mean, the music yeah. rights is what killed us. Those bands had blown up into um, huge bands. Yeah, and, I, I remember. And yeah, and that was a kick ass um, soundtrack. It was a great soundtrack, very expensive soundtrack, unfortunately. I think I was associate publisher of heavy metal. I, I have to look it up. I think I, I might have been associate publisher of heavy metal magazine, which um, was a wonderful, absolute. I wish I, I don't know how many I have, but I'll try to find some copies. Well, that was back when. Guccione did Penthouse, Omni, and Heavy Metal, right? Wasn't all Guccione? No, 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 no. Heavy Metal was a sister publication of National Lampoon that we did in the 80s oh, okay. and had nothing to do with Guccione. Guccione had Omni, which was science, a hmm. straight nonfiction science magazine run by his wife or girlfriend um, or daughter or well, somebody. And then Spin was given to his son, um, Shout for Rhino. Okay, well, I, I had a feeling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I mean, heavy metal, we had all these French uh, science fiction illustrators. I mean, it was just absolutely gorgeous, um, mm -hmm. the magazine itself, and um, perfectly bound um, on pretty good paper, you know, pretty good stock. And there's some good stories I, I could tell about uh, having trouble getting that magazine into Canada. Let me put it that way. I'll tell you a good story. All right. Well, perfect. We'll say that probably for a uh, locals exclusive, mm -hmm. if not here. And for now, everybody, see you Tuesday. Okay. That's it. See you. Thanks for coming <laughs> by. <laughs>